Well, years ago, I heard the late Brazilian pastor, uh, Nilson Fanini, tell a story about a unique experience he had in Africa. Uh, he was part of an agricultural mission team from his church in Brazil uh, to a part of Africa that had experienced a drought and bad crops for several years. And the purpose of his team, again, it was going from Brazil uh, to Central Africa, was to teach African farmers uh, new methods of farming uh, that would help them survive seasons of poor production. Uh, they, but they, along with the farmers and uh, engineers and scientists they took, they also were able to take a thousand Bibles printed in the language of the people that lived in the area where they were hoping to do the work. Uh, they arrived in the village late in the afternoon, as I recall him saying, uh, but somehow, uh, unbeknownst to them, word had spread or leaked out that they had arrived with Bibles. And in the morning, so they got there in the late afternoon, evening, by the next morning, they woke up and looked outside the compound, and there standing in the darkness was a line of people over a mile long. People had walked from villages from the entire surrounding area, hearing that there were Bibles, just hoping to get their hands on their own copy of God's Word. I remember thinking, wow, can you imagine such hunger for God's Word? Can you imagine standing in line all night, not for an iPad or a new iPhone or Super Bowl tickets, but just to get your hands on your own copy of God's Word? We're in the third week of our study of our series right now called The Way of Delight, Growing in God's Word. And our key text for this series, the entire series out of Psalm 119, comes in verses 14 through 16. Let me put them on the screen. Let me read it for you. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. That's why those people came all those ways and stood in the line to get their Bible. It was like getting great riches. I meditate on your precepts and I consider your ways. I delight in your decrees and I will not neglect your word. For two weeks now, we've been challenging you to try to memorize that last sentence. And this might be the last week we give you a prompt, but I'm going to put it on the screen. I wonder if you'll say it with me. If, if possible, shut your eyes, try to say it from memory. All right? Ready? I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. And so far in this series, we've looked at God's word as the way of truth. That is, God's word is trustworthy. God's word is the way of righteousness. That is, God's word is law. It carries authority. But today we're shifting gears just a bit. We're looking at God's word as the way of purity. God's word is the way of purity. Our three verses for today are Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. By the way, let me also challenge you not just to memorize that one line, but read through Psalm 119 throughout this series. If you read through the entire series, uh, Psalm, in the six weeks of this series, it takes about four verses a day. Read it in four to eight verses a day, which is about as much as you should read to really think about it. But read through the entirety of Psalm 119 while we're preaching on it. Psalm 119, verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Three things. First, God's Word is more than information. God's Word is more than information. Years ago, a man named Dr. Edward Muhima visited FBCG, as I recall, on a Sunday evening at the East Campus, spoke to about a group of only about 40 people. At the time, Dr. Muhima led a missions organization in Uganda. He began his talk that night, and I've never forgotten his opening sentence. He said, I am the 22nd of 43 children born to my father and his seven wives, he said. You just don't hear stuff like that in our culture very often, and I didn't forget it, and that got my attention. And then he went on to tell something of the story of his life, how he converted to Christianity by going to a mission school as a young boy, how then he fled Uganda during the murderous rule of Idi Amin, how he then earned two doctorates in ancient Semitic languages in the United States, and then returned to the, serve the people of Uganda as pastor and seminary professor. And along the way, he told this story, also one I've not forgotten. After he returned to Africa, he was walking through a slum area one day, uh, and Africa is filled with, with slums that some of them are a mile to walk across or two miles to walk across. Just incredibly uh, uh, sad to see. But he walked through a slum area, and he was approached by a man who was begging for money. Uh, Dr. Mohima had no money to offer him, but he was carrying his Bible. 
So he said, I have no money to give you, sir, but what I have I will give you, I get, and I'll give you my Bible. The man took the Bible, but was angry because he, what he really wanted was money. And he said to Dr. Mahima, thank you, but I will use the pages of this book to roll my cigarettes. And he walked away. So some 10 years later, Dr. Mahima is preaching in a different city, large outdoor gathering of people, and a man stood up in a crowd partway through the sermon and shouted out, sir, do you recognize me? And Mohima had no idea, said, no, I do not. He said, 10 years ago, I asked you for money in the streets of a different city, but you gave me your Bible instead. I was angry, and I told you I would use his pages to smoke my cigarettes, and I did. He said, I smoked my way through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But when I got to John, I stopped and read a page as I prepared to roll, and I read the 16th verse of the third chapter, sir, and it said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And I came all this way just to thank you for giving me your Bible. I love that story. First of all, because it's, it's, it's a fun story, but secondly, because it reminds me that the Bible is not like other books. It's not. I remember taking a class on Bible while I was in college, and I didn't go to a Christian college uh, my, for my undergraduate work. And the class was taught uh, from kind of an academic point of view, and that was new for me. I grew up in the church. I grew up with God's Word. But it was looking at the Bible as an example of ancient religious, historical, and cultural literature. And the class was interesting. There was lots of information. But I remember thinking to myself, they're kind of missing the point. Frederick Buechner writes, there are people who say we should read the Bible as literature, read it like any other book. The trouble is, it's not like any other book. To read the Bible as literature is like reading Moby Dick as a whaling manual or the Brothers Karamazov for its punctuation. <laughs> See, the Bible is not primarily a book of literature, although it contains marvelous literature, poetry and prose. The Bible is not primarily a book of common sense wisdom, although it speaks to almost every single human condition you can imagine. The Bible is not primarily a book of history, although it proves to be spot on and relentlessly accurate with, with reference to dates, events, and geography. The Bible is not primarily a book of science, although the more we learn of astrophysics and the origins of the universe, the more we're amazed by its scientific insight. The Bible is the story of God's revelation of himself, his relationship with human beings in general, and his relationship with you in particular. The Bible is about God. It tells us God's story. But the Bible is also about you. It tells your story and has power to reshape your story. If we read the Bible from any other viewpoint, we might find it interesting, thought-provoking, moderately helpful, but we'll miss the point. God's Word is more than information. God's Word is about transformation. And that leads us to point two. That's because, secondly, God's Word is aimed at both mind and heart. God's Word is aimed at both mind and heart. As most of you know, I grew up in a pastor's home, and I consider it a great blessing in my life that I don't remember a single day of my life when I didn't know about Jesus. It was my parents teaching and their modeling. I grew up also with God's Word. Uh, so by the time I was in kindergarten, I knew Scripture verses like John 3.16. I don't know how many I could have recited to, but I knew them. I also knew that God's Word taught us right from wrong very early in my life. But when I was in about the third grade, I began having trouble in one of my school subjects. I no longer remember which one, if it was uh, vocabulary or math, or probably math, because that's what I tended to have trouble with. I, I don't remember which one. But my teacher started putting some unfamiliar red marks on my schoolwork. Letters much further down the alphabet than I was used to seeing, you know, the A's and B's. And so I was too shy to ask my teacher for help. I kind of always struggled with that. I was embarrassed to show my parents and tell my parents about it. I didn't know what to do. Uh, so um, I devised a plan. I would show my parents the A's and B's, and I would take away the C's, D's, and F's, and stash them behind the bookcase in my bedroom at home. Plan worked perfectly uh, for a while. One day my dad was waiting for me when I got home from school. A little unusual, but nothing to be alarmed about. He said, how was school today? I said, fine, dad. He said, how are you doing in your classwork? I started to feel a little queasy, but I said, okay. And then the big one, 
have you been showing your mom and me all your papers? I had a decision to make. I'm a third grader now. I'm thinking to myself, do I tell the truth about what I've been doing and all those bad marks, or do I risk, do I risk a lie and hope that my hiding place is secure? I chose poorly. <laughs> my dad then took out a wad of papers. He already had them in his hand that my mom had found evidently while she was cleaning. Uh, now, two things here. What kind of mom cleans behind a bookcase? And secondly, I learned a lesson straight from Psalm 119. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray away from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, next week, Jeff's going to talk about how the word shapes our minds. But today, the subject is how the word shapes our hearts. First, what is meant by pure? by purity. Is purity the same as perfection? That's kind of what it sounds like. How can a human being be perfectly pure? We know from other places in Scripture, like Romans 3, for example, that no one is righteous, not one, that all have sinned. So how can we be pure? Doesn't that set the bar awfully high, maybe too high? Let's dig in a little bit. The Hebrew word used here for pure is zakar, or zakah. And it carries a meaning of cleansed, kept pure, to be clear, or kept translucent. Now listen to a few other translations throughout history in English. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? With what shall a young man cleanse his way? By what does a young man correct his path? It's a, it's a unique word, this word zakah for pure. So in a sense, the word is not legalistic perfection, the way we think of it, but rather a kind of relational transparency, a relational translucence, if you will, an openness of heart that is clean before God, clear before God. That's what happened after I shared with my dad what had happened, what I'd been doing. My heart became clear again. Notice the link between purity and the heart. In all three verses, there's a direct connection. I put the, the words in red here on purpose. Just let me read it through it again. And notice the connection between the words in red. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The psalm writer here is talking about two things, I think. First, obedience to the word of God to the commands of God. Earlier in the series in verse 32, Psalm 119, we read, I run in the path of your commands. Here we see, do not let me stray from your commands. Now God's commands, his desires for us are quite clear. The way of righteousness is quite clear. When God gave his commandments to his people, what we find in Exodus chapter 20, the 10 commandments, he says, you shall, you shall worship the Lord your God. You shall remember the Sabbath. You shall not worship any other gods. You shall not lie, steal, covet, commit adultery. And then moving to the New Testament, when Jesus is asked, what's the greatest of the commandments? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. He goes on to teach us to love our enemies, to be generous on every occasion, to serve and care for the poor, to forgive one another. And on and on. We know what righteousness looks like from the commands God gives us in his word. But the psalm writer is asking a question. How can a young man keep his way pure? How can I keep from straying from what I know to be your commands? And now he's talking to us about motivation. The motivation for obedience. I'm reminded of a story. I don't remember where I saw it. I had to look it up online to find it again. Second grade boy was having trouble sitting still in class. Got that boy energy. Keeps getting up to sharpening his pencil. Keeps getting up to get another crayon. Go, gets up to take another pa paper wad to the waste can. And each time he disrupts all his uh, classmates. So the teacher repeatedly asks him to sit down and be still and do his assignment. But within a few minutes, he's up again roaming around the classroom. Finally, he gets up one more time and the teacher's had enough. She loses patience. Tommy, go back to your seat and sit down. If you get up again, I'm going to give you a detention. Tommy goes back, sits down. Five minutes go by. Ten minutes go by. 
20 minutes go by, he's still in his seat. Teacher walks back to his desk and says, see, I knew you could do it, Tommy. Thanks for staying in your seat. To which Tommy looks up and responds, I may be sitting down, but I'm standing up in my heart, he says. I love that story. I may be sitting down, but I'm standing up in my heart. Now that's obedience, but that's not the obedience that the psalm is talking about here. We all know there are two basic kinds of motivation. There's what I call have to, and then there's want to. Have to and want to. Have to motivation is obeying because there are negative consequences for disobedience. Have to is sitting in your chair because your teacher's going to give you a detention if you don't. Have to is studying for the test because you get a bad grade if you don't. Have to is obeying your parents because you'll be grounded if you don't. Have to is obeying God because you fear punishment if you don't. Have to is motivation by fear or obligation or guilt. And have to motivation works, at least at some level. And have to motivation is probably the motivation we are most uh, familiar with across the face of our lives, and sadly, even in our spiritual lives. My guess is many of you here tonight, or if you're watching at the worship cafe, have lived a large portion of your lives, spiritually speaking, with have to motivation. You've been motivated to honor God's commands by fear of consequences if you don't. And have to motivation is what's called legalism. And this psalm is not teaching us have to motivation. It's not the gospel. And I believe the psalm is teaching us the second kind of motivation, which I call want to motivation. It's completely different. Want to is sitting down in your chair because you want to please your teacher. Want to is studying for the test because you love the subject matter. Want to is obeying your parents because you love and trust them. Want to is obeying God because you love him and trust his word as the way of delight. Want to motivation is not out of fear or obligation or guilt, but out of love. Sometimes I have people ask me, Pastor Brian, I, I want to study God's Word. I want to get in the Word every day, but I'm struggling to be consistent in my quiet time. I'm struggling to read God's Word every day. I'm struggling to pray every day. And sometimes I give them this response, and it's going to sound a little bit surprising. Sometimes I'll say, well, then don't. Don't until you want to. Don't do any of it until you want to. Imagine a marriage where the wife comes to the husband and says, hey, you know, I just really, why don't we spend a nice date night together? And he goes, well, if I have to, you know, if, you really, if I really have to. It doesn't work that way. It's a relationship. God wants us to want him. He wants us to want and desire his word, to long for it, not because we have to, but because we want to. That's why those African people stood in line all night to get their God's word, not because they had to because they wanted to. Want to obedience is the gospel. And that leads us to third point. God's word penetrates our hearts. God's word penetrates our hearts. A few years ago, uh, I went in for a stress test. I, I, I had no physical problems, but uh, in just the recent few weeks, I remember it was maybe ten, uh, eight, ten years ago, I had seen several men who appeared to be healthy, have significant heart issues. And I had had a couple of like little weird dizzy spells. Uh, and it just, I, you know, I just got a little bit freaked out. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to go get one of these tests done and see how, see, see how everything is. So I did. Um, I made the appointment, hooked me up to all, those, all that stuff and made me go on a treadmill. Everything was normal. And actually the doctor uh, seemed a little bit irritated with the whole process. He kept saying, why are you here again? Why are you here? How old are you? Uh, like I was disrupting his day or something. He was just irritated. So I wanted to say to him, you're a doctor, right? You're a doctor, right? You're a doctor. And you're a cardiologist, right? Uh, and uh, you're getting paid, I assume. You got my insurance information. Well, then do your job, you know? <laughs> just check out my heart. I just want to know if I'm healthy or not. Anyway, did the test. And um, I wanted to do the test because I wanted someone who knew what they were looking at to actually look into my heart for potential problems. But that's what the Word of God does. It's like God's stethoscope. It's like God's stress test. Look at this verse from Hebrews chapter, 12, uh, chapter 4, beautiful verse. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now notice three things here. There's lots in this, this passage, but three things. 
God's word is living and active. Let's go back to the African man who smoked his way through the New Testament until he came to reading one verse. Why did reading one verse on one page change the course of his life? Well, because the Bible's not like other books. Because the Bible, and the Bible is not like other books, because it's the Word of God. And the Word of God is a living thing. The same Word in Genesis chapter 1 that spoke the universe into existence, the same Word that became flesh and dwelled among us, that same Word speaks to us and speaks personally. There's no way to read this sentence, how can a young man keep his way pure without it becoming personal? You read that sentence and you have to say, how can I keep my way pure? Is my way pure? How's my heart? And that's because, secondly, the Word of God is sharp. Scripture says it's sharp and it penetrates. Now, we have several phrases in English that get at what the Bible is saying about itself here. We say things like, cut to the chase, meaning get to the point. We say things like, that really cuts to the heart, meaning something that's said or written that went deeper than just information. It cuts into who we are. And God's Word is both. God's Word cuts to the chase because it gets right to the point. And God's Word uh, cuts to the heart because it's sharp, and it's sharp because it's true. How does a young man keep his way pure? My father asked me, have you been showing us all your work? Is your way pure today? Is your way clear before God? It tells us the truth about God. It tells us the truth about us. And the truth cuts deep. I used to have a friend. I had a friend many years ago. still a friend today. But he wrote me a letter back when we still wrote letters that I still have. He was describing his growing experience of prayer. And here's how he described prayer. He said, every day I lay down under the hand of the good surgeon once again. Every day I lay down under the hand of the good surgeon once again. His word cuts, but his word is good and true. Thirdly, it judges the heart. The word of God judges the heart. Back to my friendly doctor. By hooking me up to all those wires, he can actually see through technology into my body, into the organ called the heart. That is the organ that pumps life into my uh, body by giving me blood at the rate of over a gallon a minute. And all of you, it's happening right now. We don't think about it. We don't have to try, but it's doing that all the time. He could look into that organ. He could see if there were any clogged arteries, any issues with valves, any buildup of dangerous cholesterol, whatever. He could judge my heart's health. It's what he was trained to do. And God's Word judges the content of our hearts by holding it up to truth, the truth and character of God himself. But, and this is really, really important, especially for some of you tonight, God's word does not judge to condemn. God's word judges to make pure. There's that word again. To make us transparent and translucent and clean before him. My doctor doesn't look at the test results and go, whoa, whoa, whoa you got a major problem there. Three clogged arteries, you're going to die. Imagine a doctor that did that. Just judged, that's all. Just judged, that's it. No, a doctor doctor, uh, diagnoses in order to prescribe treatment so that you're healthier when you leave than when you came in. My dad didn't confront me with my hidden papers and say, you didn't tell us the truth. You're going to have to find a new family. (laughs) You know, we're done with you. No, he confronted in order to teach me and help me grow and be clearer again. God's Word doesn't judge our hearts to condemn us, rather to correct, to cleanse, to heal, to make our way pure again. I have hidden your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let's go back to our memory sentence again tonight just to encourage you. I delight in your decrees. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word, for it keeps my way pure. Let's bow in prayer, please. Actually, stand. Will you stand with me for a closing prayer tonight? Lord God, we thank you tonight for your word. Your word is not only true. Your word not only tells us your commands, but your word is living and active. Your word cuts deep into our hearts, not to condemn, 
but to heal, to make clear, to make pure again. Teach us to love your word. Teach us to long for your word. Teach us to take delight in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.